This is an introduction to Cats and Post. Michael Hayden is famously quoted as having said, we kill people based on metadata. Um, so any, anything we do to prevent metadata leakage can only really augment what these powers can do. They have remote code execution vulnerabilities, so they can probably compromise all of our computers. So let's, um, let's think about what, what can we do with our communication systems to make them more resilient, uh, withstand mass surveillance, protect people's privacy, prevent metadata leakage. So the types of metadata leakage we're thinking of preventing are these types. Location, geographical location is definitely important, but so is the message sender and receiver. And what are our options for doing this? We, th we feel that uh, decryption mixed nets are the best option because they scale really well in terms of being uh, having low computational overhead. And they, um, uh, we think that they can scale to uh, millions of users uh, pretty easily uh, for low bandwidth applications. Now, there's uh, verified mix shuffles are also mixed networks, but they have um, more computational overhead and they have different security goals. They're designed for things like voting systems and things like that. Um, and these other designs are, uh, are in fact, um, designs that work to prevent metadata leakage uh, for uh, global adversaries on the network, but they don't scale really well and there's other design problems with them. So David Chum came up with mixed networks in 1981. His, uh, his paper here has all the big ideas in it. It's got sender anonymity, anonymous replies, receipts, pseudonyms. So here's a basic mixed net diagram, architecture diagram. So the way it works is clients retrieve a view of the network from some kind of PKI system, then they can send messages into the mixed network once they know the information, which surely includes um, connectivity information like IP addresses and TCP port numbers, but also uh, cryptographic key material. And so uh, here, let's, we'll describe a basic threshold mix, which is, so a mix is a router, a cryptographic router, and it accumulates messages until it hits the threshold number of messages. Then it shuffles them and sends them out. Now these, even though they're shuffled, uh, the messages are also bitwise unlinkable. So they've gone through a cryptographic transformation in passing through this router. Um, so mixed networks use uh, nested encryption. So each message is encrypted multiple times. And every time they traverse one of these cryptographic routers, one of these mixes, uh, one of the layers of encryption is removed. So that means that each of these output messages are completely bitwise indistinguishable from messages, the, the four messages that entered this mix. Um, and in fact, so since the threshold is four, and, and this is a very low threshold, obviously we wouldn't want to use this as just an example, but this threshold is, is four, so each of these messages, if, if you were to guess which uh, input message corresponds to each of these output messages, you, you would have a 25% chance of being correct. Um, so there, and th this paper written by Claudia and Andre is about, uh, um, it's a kind of functional analysis of mixed strategies. There's dozens of other mixed strategies. They have different security and performance trade-offs. And in this paper, they have functional graphs showing latency versus mix entropy for each mix strategy. And it's quite interesting. I recommend it. Uh, and then, so now let's just briefly describe a very simple attack it's called the N minus one attack. <clears throat> and I describe these attacks because, um, you know, I mean, nothing's perfect. I want you to know that mixed networks have attacks. We also have partial defenses. So, so consider this. The adversary sees the target message enter the mix. So he sends his own messages into the mix. Now that that threshold is met, um, the adversary knows which uh, these three messages at the bottom here are his own, so that this one unrecognized message must be that target message. So there, attack successful, complete. Um, uh, you, and if you have m multiple hops in your mix network, then you just complete, uh, you repeat the attack. 
and and so the multiple hops in the mix network there's many different possible ways to have this so the cascade topology uh, was introduced by david chum in his first paper and it's it's a good way to model certain types of mixed network designs before actually using it in a production environment now why 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 this would be why is this advantageous to just having a single mix it should be obvious right because each of these mixes here are operated by different entities, right? This is the whole point. If you operate your own mix network yourself, what's the point? You might as well have a, a just a computer in the closet, and it's like, okay, you know, you've got your router. But here we have four different servers operated by different entities, and so if one of them is compromised, you, you've still got something. You still have the security properties you're looking for, right? Each one of these are adding latency and bitwise unlinkability to your to your network interactions. Um, so so and so that's the good thing about this. The bad thing about this is it doesn't scale well at all with respect to the number of users using this. Number of users goes up, and the bandwidth capacity in this thing goes down, right? And there's no way to scale it besides replace these computers and these internet links with more powerful computers and fatter, bigger internet links. And so this is this doesn't really scale. And also, it doesn't have high, any high availability mechanism, right? There's no failover mechanism, no way to route around damage in the network. So, so those are some problems with this. Um, one good uh, property of this is that it's pretty easy to calculate the Shannon entropy of each mix when they're in a cascade like this. And um, it also, um, and it, yeah, and so it distributes the entropy um, nice, uh, in a nice and easy way that we can calculate it. Um, so, I mean, yeah, this is a silly uh, graphical representation of what I think of free route, just like a every possible uh, combination of route is expressed, but maybe if a computer drew it, it would look more like this. Um, but this is actually problematic because if we take a look at this diagram, Bob over here on the right is sending a message to Alice here on the left. Now, if you look at mix one, mix one is receiving a message from mix two, which Bob sent, but mix one is also receiving a message from Alice. So now mix, mix one has two messages that should be getting mixed, but they're not because their source network location uh, is different for these two messages. So one is coming from Alice and one is coming from mix two. And they're, um, so these, th this is the distinguishing characteristic in the input traffic to this mix, but actually each of these mixes here, mix two and mix three as well, have this same distinguishing characteristic that is the source network address of the input messages is distinguishable. So given that it's a distinguishing characteristic, it, it splits the anonymity set into two in each mix. So this is bad. <laughs> this is what we want to avoid, right? So, um, so this actually lowers the entropy in each mix. Um, so that's why we don't want free route. Um, why, why else might we not? Why, well, why do we want free route? First of all, why do we consider it? It's because it scales a lot better than Cascade, right? If we want, we can add more computers if, if we have more users and more traffic using, using the network. So it definitely scales well. Um, but uh, but there's, a, there's a better trade-off we can make, and, and that's called the stratified topology. And so the stratified topology looks like this. We have different layers, and each um, layer one can only send messages to layer two, and layer two can only send messages to layer three. So um, the routes are more restricted, so there's fewer routes. But because of this restriction, we don't, we no longer have the distinguishing characteristic of source addresses for input messages to each mix. The source address for for each message. Um, entering layer three is always one of the addresses for a mix in layer two. It's never going to be different. So the, the stratified topology is, um, is a entropy preserving topology for mixed nets, right? Like it allows us, it, it does, it, um, 
it allows us to preserve more entropy in the system without splitting these anonymity sets. Uh, and it scales well with respect to the number of users and traffic because in each of these layers we can we can always add more mixes if if we need to scale up. Um, and so this is another diagram. Uh, I'm kind of um, this is kind of like from the Lupix paper. Uh, I mean, it's the diagram's not from the Lupix paper. The the idea, the design, right? So here we have a stratified topology, and we have a layer of providers, and then a bunch of mix layers, and then another layer of providers. And actually, this is kind of a mirror image of the layers of providers, because these two layers of providers on the right and left here are actually the same providers. So this is sort of a, a graphical representation of what it looks like to send a message through through a Lupix mixnet, such as Cats and Post. So, um, this is to illustrate the fact that the providers are the always the first hop and the last hop in a route, and they have a uh, they are essentially providers are essentially mixes. Um, they uh, they just have some other features, like they might have a service running on them that can respond to your message, or they might have a queue that could queue your message for to be retrieved later by someone else, perhaps. Okay, and the other topology I wanted to talk about is a multi-cascade topology. So let's, uh, here's, there's a reason why we have this. So uh, Amir Hertzberg came up with this in, in um, well, I didn't link to the paper here. Anyway, so um, this is essentially like if we, if we have a PKI or a directory authority system, it could advertise several different cascades, and then each MixNet user in the system could use one cascade for, I don't know, say a week, right? And so this is kind of, mm, in terms of design, the opposite of stratified topology, where you are probably you're going to choose a new route through the network with every single message you send. So if we think about it, um, this is a little. Uh, no matter what, we have some risk. So let's understand which risk risks we have. So in this one, the risk is that if there's one, if there's a mix in each layer that is compromised, then the more messages you send. Uh, you'll choose more different routes through the network, and eventually you'll choose the bad route where every mi mix in the route is compromised. And yeah, and so for mixed networks, it, it has to be every single mix in the route is compromised for this attack to work. Otherwise, you're just um, you're just playing games with statistics. You're 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 doing a statistical disclosure attack, um, which I will talk about soon. Um, but without a statistical disclosure attack, if it's direct observation correlation, um, then we need the adversary needs to compromise every single mix in the route. Uh, because the threat model for mix nets is that you, if you have one good mix in your route, you've still got something. You've still got the anonymity security properties because that one mix can uh, can add bitwise unlinkability and latency uh, to prevent the leaking leaking the uh, um, the correlation between its input and output messages. So this situation here is different because if we choose a cascade and it's not compromised, then for the rest of the week you use that cascade, you win. Um, and and that's quite different than choosing a, a new set of cascade, a new, essentially, which is kind of like a new cascade, but a new route through the network, every single message. So so they have, so the uh, the downside, obviously, though, is if you select a, a bad cascade, well, then you're kind of screwed for the next week. Um, so, uh, so this is a good paper about the network topology, and they discuss different trade-offs for entropy and uh, things like that. Uh, so if we abstract away all these details, uh, we can just represent the entire mixnet with a single mix or a single router, single cryptographic router. And it's got input messages and, and these output messages on the right here. So one of the Alice's is talking to one of the Bob's, or they're all talking to each other. Um, and so here's, here's an idea for you. Now, if Alice 1 goes offline and Bob 1, 2, and 3 receive 5% fewer messages, then that is statistical information that's being leaked. And that is called a statistical disclosure attack. And we can't actually prevent that attack. What we can do is 
comment on different scenarios in which mixed networks are used, and we can analyze whether that attack is even appropriate or not. Like sometimes these attacks uh, will not converge on success. Uh, it depends on how the mixed network is used. It depends on how repetitive and predictable user behavior is. And it also depends on the rate of information leakage in the mixed network. So, um, so when uh, so we can expand this diagram, and these two vertical lines represent the two points in the network that the adversary must watch to perform this attack. So one of the clients on the left is sending a message to one of the clients on the right. Okay, fine. So we don't actually have to watch the whole mixed network. Great, I'm going to just watch all the clients that talk to the network. Okay. So, um, so how how can this be improved? So uh, in the Lupix anonymity system, this is this is a recent paper, and the Cats and Posts mixed network is, is is based on a lot of the design in this paper. The diagram looks more like this. So we have clients on the left and providers on the right, not clients on the right. And so what this means is that the adversary can watch these two vertical bars here and see messages enter the mixnet from individual clients. Uh, however, on the right, when messages go from the mixnet to the provider, a provider could be providing service for 10,000 clients or a million clients. So now if each of these providers are receiving these messages, we don't know exactly which users are receiving those messages. So that is less granular statistical information that's being leaked. And here we have clients that can send requests to their providers and they can receive messages in response to the provider. Um, okay, so we're gonna talk about this protocol between clients and providers a bit more pretty soon. Um, so all messages in cats and posts pretty much look like this loop here. Uh, so Alice routes a message through the mixed network to some provider and that provider could um, send a response to her. So the response is uh, traversing the network back to Alice in an anonymous fashion. The provider that she's sending a message to has no idea where on the network Alice is. Uh, but the response gets back to her because of the Sphinx packet format. Um, there's uh, what's called a single-use reply block, and it's kind of like a self-addressed stamped envelope with, um, with your address encrypted. Um, okay, so the traffic padding protocol that we're using between clients and providers, as described in the Lupix paper, is also what we're doing in Cats and Posts. So if Jean-Paul only has one message in spool number two, this, uh, this protocol will send him the same amount of information as it is also sending Nathan and, and Ada. So the, every client interacting with the provider looks like they, um, they are sort of have indistinguishable uh, behavior from each other. Um, clients are also um, polling the provider periodically uh, at regular intervals. So the Sphinx packet format is cool. Um, this paper, you should read it uh, if you're interested in learning more detail about the cryptographic packet format. So this is the nested encrypted packet format that uh, decryption mixnets uh, should use. Um, it's what Cats and Post uses. And um, the, it, the Sphinx has a lot of cool properties, a lot of cool um, cool features. So there's per hop bitwise unlinkability, single use reply blocks for anonymous replies. Uh, replies are indistinguishable from normal forward messages. Um, hidden path length, hidden relay position, tagging attack detection, and replay attack detection. Um, and it's a bit too much detail for me to go over all these features in this talk here, but uh, I, I might briefly mention them if they come up again. Uh, so the Sphinx, but briefly I'll describe the, the Sphinx packet essentially has a header and a body. And the header has three fields, has a public key, uh, which is uh, blinded at each hop Mm, so to save space in the header so that we don't have to keep storing public keys for each hop. Uh, there's encrypted routing information here, and this contains uh, one slot 
of routing commands for each hop. So these are encrypted routing commands that you that the sender of the Sphinx packet can send uh, secretly or pri um, confidentially to each mix in in the hop in the route. Um, and this MAC on the right, it, it's a message authentication code. It it authenticates the the routing information here. The body authenticates itself because the body is encrypted with an SPRP, uh, uh, a, a wide block cipher, and um, so the uh, the plain text can be verified, uh, not the cipher text. Um, more about SPRPs in a different talk, maybe. Anyway, um, compulsion attacks are kind of the worst attack for mixed networks. And oddly enough, uh, interestingly enough, um, Tor is actually uh, m safer against compulsion attacks than mixed networks. But saying that, I feel a little uh, sort of like the comparison is not fair, because Tor is trivially broken by a global adversary, whereas mixed nets are not. So mixnets have this one attack where if I send a Sphinx packet out into the mix network, the, if the adversary captures it, uh, they can have the mix network operator decrypt it. They can force them through legal action, police raid, or pwn their computer and get their cryptographic key material, and they can decrypt this packet. They will then be able to read the encrypted routing information, and they can see where it's the next hop is supposed to go to. And then they can subpoena legal police raid action that next uh, mix operator and get him to decrypt the message. And they can keep doing this until the entire route is compromised. Um, OK, so how can we defend against this? So normally, our defense is a key erasure scheme. And the normal key erasure scheme used in mixed networks is mix key rotation. So this is when, um, so keys expire. Uh, and there could be different types of systems, uh, but the one we designed for cats and post, mix keys, for, for the time being right now, mix keys uh, are valid for three hours. And then there's a rotation period. So there's an epoch time mechanism that we have. And so, I mean, in terms of our key expiry erasure scheme here, keys expire every three hours, but uh, a single Sphinx packet can traverse the uh, epoch boundary as it's going through the network because there's some grace period um, after expiry. Um, the other defense against this besides a mix key rotation scheme is another type of erasure scheme, another type of cryptographic erasure scheme uh, called forward secure mixes. Uh, or forward secure mixes? Yeah. So, uh, so there. I mean, I mean, there's two papers on this. Uh, there's a lot of papers not published, um, but it's got some pretty good ideas in it about how to do this. So the idea is that it, it, you could, through say one of the hops in your route, um, that one hop could be a forward secure mix, and it could uh, it could have a, a separate key just for you to interact with. Um, and then it destroys the key immediately after that interaction, or, or rolls it forward. Um, now, the, in this Lottl system, they're using, you know, sort of more modern ratchet with the post uh, post quantum encryption. But um, but the point that doesn't matter. I mean, the point, the idea is the same as in uh, George Janice's paper, forward secure mixes, which is that you're interacting with the with, 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 not with the normal public mix key everyone else is interacting with. You're interacting with one specific key that you set up earlier, and that key uh, is immediately destroyed, and then another key in its place is used. Uh, and you, you are able to predict what that other key is. Like, it could be a hash of the old key or some, some, some such thing. Um, and, and so what, are, what other defenses are there for compulsion attacks? I mean, right, this is kind of like the uh, pretty devastating for mixed networks, right? Because we can't really prevent it, but, but we can make it harder. So multicast routing hops, compulsion traps, and plausible deniable routing are some other tactics. And they're, they're so compulsion-resistant anonymous communication by George Genesis. This is another paper 
uh, I mean, if you're if you're interested in going more detail, in the future in Cats and Posts we might implement some of these. But for right now, we think that mixed key rotation is the main strategy for key erasure. And in, in the future, we might consider forward secure mixes. However, forward secure mixes have this one downside, which is that since uh, you're interacting with one specific key, it's correlating um, all your interactions with that mixed network with like one entity who proves that they have some uh, knowledge of some key. So that that is actually um, leaking extra information to this one mix. So I, I believe that these types of uh, strategy should be used sparingly. I mean, you should have a lot of other mixes surrounding it. It should, it should be in the middle of the route. Uh, I mean, it's, yeah, if the adversary compromises the forward secure mix, uh, that's that's pretty bad, right? They're, they're getting a lot of leaked information there. So I, I'm not sure if, if we should use them or not, but let's write papers and talk about it. And yeah, these other strategies, I think they would, these are interesting to explore. And um, yeah, there's there's even uh, some other different sort of uh, attacks to consider. Um, say, um, I mean, there's this, these two papers kind of, uh, they, they kind of, um, how shall I say, they explore using a uh, net, uh, a network connectivity reputation system. I mean, that is to say the reputation system is sort of keeping track of network connectivity and um, and they have a different, uh, this, they're using the multi-cascade topology. Um, so I mentioned it earlier. Um, so yeah, the, these two papers are also s somewhat interesting for considering compulsion attacks, right? Because if you think about it, uh, mixes that are already compromised and maybe you're selecting them for your route or, or maybe you're selecting new routes for each message or maybe you decide to use like one of these strategies where you're using one cascade for a week or so. The, these are kind of considerations that are going to protect you against compulsion attacks in different ways with different probabilities of success. So th these are a, a, a different approach than what we've been talking about. And I think it's good to consider all these different approaches. And, and so Cats and Post has three different types of components, right? There's, there's mixed servers, which can be a provider or a mix. Uh, there's the PKI servers, or uh, the voting directory authority that I mentioned. And then there's clients. Um, and the, here's another mention of the Lupix paper. Uh, and so Cats and Post is essentially the Lupix design, but with a lot more detail. So when when a lot of these mixed net papers are written, they're uh, considering mixed networks as this high level abstraction. But when we actually designed it, we need to we need to consider many things for um, many things besides just the strict mixed net abstraction. And so what is Cats and Post? I would say Cats and Post is uh, is software that you can actually use. Um, it's it's an it's a mixed network system that is um, yeah anonymous, decentralized, message oriented. So it it kind of it, so if we're familiar with these like OSI network models where you have these seven layers, seven uh, network abstractions, and we think of we think of them, right, as there's a physical layer, link layer, network layer, transport layer, session layer, presentation layer, application layer. Well, if a mixed network, the way we're building it, it it's not on the, we're not like reprogramming Cisco routers and stuff, right? It's an overlay network. So we're la layering it on top of the internet. So the, so the existing internet protocol is kind of like our physical layer here, which is, see on the right here, so I have this, kind of other list corresponding. So, and our link layer for the mixed network is TCP plus a noise-based cryptographic protocol. Uh, so that's pretty cool. And our noise-based cryptographic protocol is, uh, has got a hybrid forward secret um, uh, mode f to its handshake. Uh, so it uses New Hope Simple as the key encapsulation mechanism. and. So I, th I think it's a lot safer than most um, link layer encryptions that are being used. 
Um, okay, so the network layer. The network layer, which would normally be like internet protocol, you know, IPv4, IPv6, here in the mixed network, it's the Sphinx cryptographic routing protocol, which is not a protocol unto itself, really. It's more like the Sphinx cryptographic packet format can be used in, in many different ways, and we're using it in one specific way to route messages through the mixed network. And this allows us to have anonymous replies, and it, it, makes, it makes it so that our traffic is uniform. Uh, uniform in timing, more or less, but also in, in other ways, too. Uh, so, so consider this. Um, so our Sphinx packets are the same size. The, the header is always the same size. The payload of the packet is always the same size. Now, we could have multiple sizes, uh, but then we would want to have multiple sizes of decoy traffic as well. So one, one thing I didn't yet talk about in this talk is that we do, we do have decoy traffic. Um, and then, so then the layer on top of this Sphinx is uh, a custom ARQ. ARQ stands for automatic repeat request, and this is a uh, error correction mechanism where you will use acknowledgments and retransmit if you don't get your acknowledgment, kind of like TCP, but um, I mean, well, everybody just refers to as TCP as the most common cited example of an ARQ. Uh, but uh, for certain protocols, like over a mixed network, it would be nothing like TCP. Um, TCP has many different, uh, very specific design requirements that, that we don't have. OK, so then on top of that, uh, on our reliability protocol on top, here we have signal double ratchet or OTRv4. Either one will work. Just some modern ratchet-based forward secret encryption protocol with post-compromise security. That's, that's what we want there. So that's what it is. Uh, and then on top of that, so some message application. So the idea, hopefully, is that all these layers on the right here will be present in various client libraries, and we can use them for integration easily in, in existing applications that want to send messages privately without leaking much metadata. Um, so our noise-based link layer, this is what our noise protocol string looks like here on the bottom. It's pretty cool. Noise, XX, HFS, Dufa519, New Hope Simple, ChaCha Poly, Blake2B. Um, all right, so this is a this is a AQM pipeline diagram. So AQM is active queue management algorithm. And so these are all the active queues that are present in our automatic repeat request uh, client design. So, so in other words, in order to get the client to retransmit messages to achieve reliability over the mixed network, end-to-end -end reliability, we have the client engage in this kind of computational pipeline here where um, so a client application sends a message into the, uh, oh, it says egress 5 q Hmm, I suppose we could call it that. Yeah, it's an egress 5 queue. Anyway, it sits in the queue for some period of time. There's a Poisson process that chooses the delays for between pulling messages out of this FIFO queue. Um, so, uh, by the way, if it pulls, a, if, it, if the queue is empty, it sends a, um, a decoy drop message. Uh, um, let's talk about de um, let's talk about decoy messages soon in the next few slides. So. This, uh, so this message is sent to the mixed network. If we get an acknowledgment back, uh, we, um, this acknowledgment acts as a cancellation for, for the retransmission. So, um, so, but if we are going to retransmit, uh, it's, it's going to go into this other delay for an exponential delay. And then, uh, and this exponential delay queue really, it, it means at the very least we have to delay the retransmission uh, exponentially, uh, but then we actually have to delay it more than that um, because retransmissions need to be need to be uh, unpredictable, um, and they need to have the unpredictable timing in order to prevent active confirmation attacks. And, th and that's probably a bit too detailed for this talk. Um, so inside the each mix, so this is sort of more or less what's going on inside the client. Um, but inside each mix in the in the network, uh, this is what's going on. So this cloud is the rest of the mix network, 
and then messages, there's uh, sort of, the messages enter this pipeline, right? And so there's a uh, listener, um, uh, inform connection worker is sort of es establishes the, our noise link layer protocol. Um, and then crypto workers receive Sphinx packets and remove a layer of encryption and then send those packets to a strategy, a mixed strategy queue where they get queued up. And then when they get sent out, they get sent out to this dispatcher and it sends them to the correct mix on the mix network according to its routing information. Uh, and so here's a kind of expanded view. Well, no, this is not expanded. So there's more, this is the exact same diagram with more stuff here added on the right. And so this extra stuff here, which is in orange, this, these are all the parts of the, these are all um, components of a provider. So a provider is just like a mix, except that it's got more stuff on it. So the, the more things it has, so it has, it has services and it has spools. Spools are places we can store messages to later be retrieved. And services are things you can send messages to. They are uh, computer programs that you can interact with. Um, and so our services, we have uh, several plugins. So we have, a, we have an API you can use and you can modify the mix source code and add a service into the mix. Or you can use our plugin system, uh, which is that you can make a external computer program that is uh, ran, ran by our mix server on startup and it communicates with the mix server or, over a Unix domain socket and it sends messages, receives messages and sends messages to the mix. Um, and so these external services, they can be anything. They can be stuff that has nothing to do with mixnets, like retrieve me a web archive file of such and such web page, or submit this Zcash transaction to the Zcash blockchain. Uh, just a couple examples. So the submit Zcash transaction to Zcash blockchain, uh, <laughs> here's, here's a capitalist dude, stick figure with the top hat, and uh, he wants to send a Zcash transaction to one of these three providers that have the Zcash uh, transaction submission service. Um, but his client's also sending decoy traffic through the mix network. Um, and there's also a bunch of other top hatted dudes uh, sending transactions through the mix network to, to Zcash blockchains as well. So, so it all works out nicely because um, he's essentially hidden in a crowd here. And yeah, that's the end of our talk. Um, please contact me if you have.